I am David Bloom. I am the moderator of a panel whose name is far too long to recount, but uh, we have six fantastically smart people who work in and around VR and AR, and we're going to talk about the hardware strategies. I am a writer and consultant. I do a column each week for a site called Tube Filter and another for a site called TV Rev. You can look them up and make fun of me and leave nasty comments like everybody else. Um, but I'm going to try to let these guys uh, show off a bit. I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves, beginning on my immediate left, uh, Bob Dylan Gale. Uh, give it a run. Dylan Thomas Gale. I like that better. It's much artsier. But he doesn't have a Nobel Prize, unlike the other guy. All right. Uh, I'm and speak into the mic, please. Pull it up towards you. Act like the mic is your friend. How's that? Because you're you on me? live cam. Is it on? Yes. Okay. Speak in. All right. Uh, I'm Dylan Gale. I'm a principal at Comcast Ventures. Comcast Ventures is a 19-year-old venture fund uh, backed by Comcast Corporation. We invest in early stage technology f uh, companies um, across a variety of different uh, sectors. Um, I'm here because I'm one of two people who cover AR and VR for the fund. Uh, we've invested in seven, uh, six VR companies and one on the AR side over the course of the last uh, roughly 24 months. Um, Companies you, you may be uh, familiar with uh, called Baobab Studios, uh, Felix and Paul Studios, Next VR, and kind of the live broadcast sports, um, Spaces, which is a loca location-based VR uh, service provider, and uh, a few others in, in um, you know, ancillary categories. Richard? Okay, my name is Richard Luque. I work for uh, Verizon, slightly older corporation, but not that old actually, coming from um, multiple uh, Bell coming together in the early 2000s. Uh, Verizon is known for um, wireless uh, access, and I guess maybe half of you have Verizon, which is about the ratio in the US. But um, I'm, I'm not too much on the wireless side of the business. I'm more on the media and uh, new business innovation. Uh, my focus is on VR and AR. Uh, I'm doing product strategy and a little bit of investment working with Verizon Ventures. I uh, help them do uh, due diligence and scouting of companies. And on the corporate strategy side of the house, uh, figuring out how Verizon can have not only an impact as a provider of uh, connectivity, but also um, on higher layer and a different part of the business of VR and AR. Jim? Hi, good morning. My name is Jim Preston. I'm executive producer at Nomadic. We are a location-based VR company, uh, an early stage startup in the Bay Area. So if you've heard of companies like The Void or Zero Latency, uh, we're going to try and be the highest fidelity version of that experience. So we build physical worlds and then we map digital worlds on top of them for uh, a very hyper-real, sort of walkable experience. Uh, personally, I've been in video games for about 20 years, most recently in electronic arts, and I'm in charge of the content play at Nomadic. Jay? Good morning, everybody. Jay Samet. I'm independent vice chairman of Deloitte. For at least about the past 10 years, we've been building uh, VR, AR, and immersive uh, experiences for our clients, whether it's for construction, training, uh, military, uh, tons of enterprise uses, and that market seems to be exploding. Good morning, everybody. My name is Sivan Iram. I'm uh, Vice President of Business Development at Lumus. We make optical systems for AR glasses, uh, both based on waveguide technology, both the waveguide itself and the projection module. Um, we work with all major OEMs uh, support them, um, trying to enable, to, to bring to life um, AR glasses. Previously, I led uh, a VR studio, so I think I have two different points of view on, on this emerging industry, one from the content side and today from the hardware side. And Shannon. Hey, I'm Shannon Norell. Um, work for the CTO of HP, and I'm the VR evangelist, XR evangelist, let's say, for HP. So uh, somewhat uh, defining new technologies that we pursue and uh, you know, spreading the gospel of, of this wonderful new XR world we're entering into. 
So what I'd like to do, um, this is about both uh, augmented reality and virtual reality, and I guess we're going to throw in, because Microsoft's here, mixed reality, which gives me a mixed feeling, because uh, I haven't really figured out why it's different. But we'll start with VR. A year ago, this time, uh, the conversations in rooms like this at Digital Hollywood and many other conferences was all about VR. The hardware was rolling out in many places, or had been out for a few months. There was a lot of talk, a lot of enthusiasm, but also some concern. And now it seems like the momentum's slowed a bit, and I want to hear from you guys about what the state is, what the opportunities are um, for VR, in-home, out-of-home, et cetera. Let's start with Dylan. So I think it's a, it's a tough environment right now. Speak in the mic. You got him on there? Okay. There we go. There we go. Okay. Um, so it's a tough environment right now uh, in the VR space. Uh, largely, that's a, a function of headset adoption. Um, you know, us as investors and, and others, um, you know, surrounding kind of the, the investor ecosystem, uh, you know, look to headset adoption as being kind of a proxy for the health of, uh, of the industry. Um, and so, you know, in large part for content creators and picks and shovels businesses, uh, it's, it's a tough, tough environment, uh, specifically on the fundraising side. Um, there are a few categories that, that are showing some promise. I think uh, I'm particularly bullish on location-based VR uh, for two different reasons. One, this is the way that the vast majority of consumers will first experience VR, which I think is, is very exciting. Um, and secondarily, it is the, the best of VR. It's the most immersive, highest end, you know, best quality experiences that you can get. Um, and so, you know, over the course of the next, call it 12 to 24 months, you're going to start seeing a lot of these location-based VR installations pop up, similar to, you know, IMAX VR, which is, you know, kind of the, the closest local um, implementation. But you're going to see them across arcades, you're going to see them in malls, you're going to see them in theme parks. Um, and, you know, I think that will be a driving force in large part to help drive, uh, hopefully, adoption in, uh, in home. Anybody else want to take a run at this? So uh, what do you guys think in terms of uh, Dylan's proposal that, that out of home, that location base and all that's going to be what's going to drive it? I know, obviously, Jay, you, I want you to talk a little bit more about the other side, the non-entertainment side. But let's start because we're in digital Hollywood. Um, on the entertainment side, what's, what's the size of that market and opportunity? If it's going to be out of home, what's that look like? Anyone want to take a shot at that? I can take some, Go ahead, some of that. So, uh, yeah. Uh, HP is all about location-based entertainment right now. I don't know if you, we've brought a, I brought a backpack unit. You may have seen HP uh, backpack, which lets you use a you know HTC Vive, really high uh, performance uh, headset, and be tetherless. Um, you know, not tripping over cables and whatnot. Uh, I think we're I'm a huge fan of Nomadic. So uh, what you guys are doing is great. Obviously, the Void's great. Um, literally 2018, I'm calling the year of LBEs. Like it's it's happening, and uh, I recently gave a, a speech at a at Con the Con Film Festival, and uh, after the event it was just literally swarmed by, you know, theater owners, people in the industry uh, c concerned or trying to figure out how to factor in VR into their current offerings, and uh, you know, frankly, it became very apparent that theater owners around the world are considering either installing a nomadic type thing in the lobby or repurposing one of the screens to be VR. People pay tickets, they go, and I highly encourage if you're in the area, go to IMAX VR to get a taste of what the world will be like. And that, that's just the beginning. That's, that's uh, anyhow. All right, so Jay, you have uh, um, come to Deloitte in the last year, uh, basically, on the, on the back of your pitch, which is a lot of businesses need this stuff. So talk about the non-entertainment enterprise yeah. opportunity in VR and what that means for companies. So where the tie-in is to, to digital Hollywood is the skill sets are the same. It's just the use case is different. The thing that's holding back most of the home and the, and the location base is the cost of the gear at today's uh, environment. When you're talking about letting a brain surgeon, and we're doing this up at Stanford, see a tumor in 3D in the OR 
instead of seeing 2D things and trying to figure out where to do, it's the cheapest piece of equipment in that OR. Uh, when you're talking about um, uh, planes have to be inspected by the FAA all the time uh, to satisfy FAA and you have to put a, a camera up in them, having people to know how to do that at all locations really tough. Having train people one location and being able to see and do inspections by VR. So there's case after case where today's technology solves billion dollar problems for industry and that scale will help the hardware makers make the money to then get to a scale to drive down the consumer market. We saw this with video, we saw this with Laserdisc, we saw this with CD-ROM and it was always envisioned to be a consumer play, and when that doesn't happen as fast, it's the enterprise that, that drives it. So you're really saying that VR guys, A, should, for the time being, certainly look at their non-entertainment things, see that as a way to build up that market. It sounds like what we're yes. really doing is creating all the context, either out-of-home entertainment or non-entertainment enterprise uses that will create the scale in the short term that drive those prices down and make it accessible. And to second, second from pricing, what is the UX? Because, I mean, I'm old enough it to remember... It stands for an ugly experience, right? No, but when Windows was coming out, Bill Gates wanted to have a mouse, and he couldn't find a single manufacturer to make the mouse because nobody believed that that's how somebody could learn to interact with the screen. It was that strange that Microsoft had to go in the hardware business for the first time. If we look today, there are so many different ways that people are pinching, tweaking, blinking, whatever, that it hasn't become a standard way to interact in this environment. And so having tens of thousands of people doing this at work, that normalcy will be developed over the next two years. Just sort of, and I hate to, boy, I hate to make uh, VR the equivalent of Windows, uh, but, uh, and the PC in the early 90s, because that, you talk about an ugly UX, that, that certainly was it. Um, so, so, is there an opportunity in, in the entertainment space in the short term? Uh, Richard, take a shot at this. So, let me come back to what you said, because there yeah. may be something to be said here between VR and, and Windows. Okay. Uh, if we're talking hardware, then we have to talk about Apple versus the rest of the world too, right? Right. From a hardware point of view, I think in VR, we don't have an Apple yet, and we don't have a Microsoft yet, meaning it's either going to be a piece of hardware with all the software contained into it, and it's going to be the de facto standard, and everybody's going to rally around that, or is it going to be someone is going to come up with an OS, call it Oculus or something else, and then everybody's going to build hardware for that OS, right? Yeah, but nobody's doing that, right? Everybody's no, like doing I, their own thing and they're not really cross-platform or any of that stuff. And so nothing can grow to a decent size, right? Also, tool sets that have APIs for all the tools that people already right. use. Right. Okay. So a lot of, a lot of our clients are, are working on that piece of the puzzle right now, building those interfaces and building those connections because the demand is so big. And though we're focused on VR, right now it's, it's AR that's Hey, 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 hey. No, 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 no AR yet. We're gonna, we're, we're, first things first. So, we'll get, we'll I get always want to say that we're, um, I mean, the, the industrial, I mean, of course, there, there's big demand there. I mean, it's small niche demand altogether becomes big, but it feels like everything is a custom job, right? Everything's a custom job. That's, that's a lot of fun for, for developers, and, I'm guessing. I mean, it's, it's, it's okay. It's great. And it's good for... It's for, very good for Deloitte. <laughs> I was about to say it's good for consulting business. But, but at the end of the day, to make it mass market for everybody to use, we're going to have to find who's going to be the Microsoft of VR um, from, from a software OS point of view, who's going to run the Oasis for people that understand the, the analogy to the book and the film coming soon. <laughs> Right. And, and who is, is going to be potentially the Apple of VR too? Because there's probably space for both. Because right. some users will want something that is just all in one box, it's working, you press a button, it's running. And some users will want to say, oh, I want to customize this, customize that, get a better piece yeah. of that. Some people want to open the box up and make right. a mess of things right. and then put it back together. Yeah. Some people just and want I, And to I don't run. know if we see any direction in one way or another from any manufacturers today. Right. Yeah, um, Jim and Savannah, I want you all to talk a little bit, particularly Jim, uh, Jim 
no, Bannock is in a lot of interesting places. I understand why HP has a love affair with them. Uh, I had your boss on a panel with me last month in Vegas talking about out of home, but give, a, give folks a broader idea of what you see in that out of home opportunity. Uh, the, the out of home opportunity, I think, is, is the most interesting when you understand what's going on in retail and cinema. You really understand the environment that it's, that it's occurring in. For folks that are trying to do a destination-based experience where you want to get people out of the car and come to your actual physical location, I think that's going to be a challenge. But if you work with what we're seeing in retail, which is a tremendous softening uh, really across the market, with retailers looking to do things beyond just sales, but are actually looking for things that are on food and beverage in a way to sort of experience shopping, and then you actually they know you're going to order it online. You don't actually come to the mall to buy things anymore. Uh, they're looking for these sort of entertainment spirits as being an anchor. So this is to drive experiential marketing at a very intense level is what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. I think that the, the malls, certainly the higher-end malls, are already seeing that this trend is just not going to reverse. And that What, do you get shot if you wear the wrong brand? Is that what happens digitally? Or? That's a great idea. I'm She's just thinking, you know, that before we have Donna Karan versus... Uh, uh, you know, I don't know if you're going to have the level of VR experience, like dovetail that completely with... Uh, with the actual purchasing experience, I, I really mean more at the whole sort of enterprise of going to a mall and that it'll be just as much fo focused on entertainment as it will be on shopping. And so when you asked earlier, like, how big is the market? Like, to be completely honest, we're not sure mm -hmm. because so much of the money that was spent at locations, we're not sure how many of those dollars are going to stay at the malls and transfer over to entertainment, food, and beverage. Um, even if it's a small percentage of, of those dollars, still that transfer is, is pretty significant. From the point of view of American consumers, those spending patterns are changing pretty dramatically. Pretty dramatically. And, that, and that's also driven, uh, those changing patterns are particularly pronounced in younger consumers who used to be the ones making the theaters work. For instance, and really, I think, gave malls a reason to run because they were coming in and buying stuff and milling around because they had nowhere to go, and now they've got other places to go. So this is, is, that's it, part of your opportunity? It's certainly true in cinemas as well, um, where... You know, Shannon mentioned earlier, there, there are cinemas that are happy to pull out, just rip out seats from underperforming screens and put in an experience that can be run by three people. You know, it can be changed out really quite easily. Um, that they want to keep people captured within the space. They've got the dwell. They want to continue to monetize it for people before they go into an experience, before they come out. They've got the point of sale where they can take the ticket. Cinemas are, are in a really good position for this. Um, and I think, uh, I think it'll just be standard in a few years to see, you know, what used to be these, you know, dozen plexes um, to have those smaller screens that are always sort of at the end of the concourse to just be sort of dedicated entertainment spaces. Interesting. Now, Savan, you are the only hardware maker. Obviously, HP makes a lot of hardware, but uh, you're the only ones actually like putting stuff out that you can, not just virtual, it's actual reality stuff here. Uh, what are you guys seeing in terms of the VR space, in terms of where you all are targeting your technologies and stuff that you're selling into other folks? What are you guys seeing? So the optical systems that we make um, are sold strictly for AR glasses. Um, I think... We can't talk about that. I know. Uh, I just <laughs> want, want to make a quick comment about location-based VR and the reason that I think there's an opportunity there, two reasons, and then what, what it means. Um, first, because always with cinemas, there's the in-home experience has gotten so much better over the past decade, uh, two decades, that it's, people are hard-pressed to get out of home and, and go to cinemas, that there's always an attempt to improve that, to include technologies that improve, that kind of create a gap between the experience you can get in the cinema compared to home. And I think VR is definitely it. Also, what, 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 what exists there, the dynamic, is that in the early days of VR, we're creating content there's, there's always the chicken and the egg. Uh, people don't have content, so they're not buying it. There's not enough, the market's not big enough, so people are not creating content. So that dynamic exists. And in those years, I think the expectation for somebody to buy a device for their home um, when there's not enough content there is a challenge, but flipping that dynamic where people go, there's, there's just one single application or one, one single experience that's being shown over months in a museum or in a cinema or somewhere public where foot traffic is large, that creates a dynamic where you can depreciate the, uh, uh, the, the investment within the content um, over more people. It's just, the dynamic is just hel healthier, I think. What it means, I think, for Hollywood, that is uh, very interesting, is the content creation is gonna change from hands of 
producers, camera people, and this whole infrastructure to coders. And they're going to be the content creators for VR, AR. I think that is a, a really interesting change. I think LA is seeing that change and it's a booming uh, tech uh, um, uh, location. And I, I think um, San Francisco is definitely uh, changing its mind. And, and you see many more companies, studios, like the one that, that, that I was involved with in like Nomadic, uh, creating content that is entertainment content. It's not, of course, there's still film, but I think increasingly we'll see more and more uh, developers as, as the new content creators. One other use case that Howie was doing that we're not talking about is the behind the scenes use of VR. Uh, VR, a uh, couple of major players are, are researching and working right now of having VR replace the cable box. So the retinal scanner becomes the new DRM. You know exactly that it is your, you're the person that has the subscription to watch this content. And now you can watch that content on a plane, you can watch it in your hotel room, you can watch it at home. Uh, wherever your eyeball is, your content then follows. So it's not just using the VR glasses to watch VR content, it's to watch the whole ha last hundred years of content in a new way that allows you to then plug your glasses into your home entertainment system when you get home, or to see the IMAX version of a film, you know, while you're stuck in an, in an airplane or an airport. I, I, I gotta wonder, and I'd like you gentlemen to, to chime in, um, the level of consumer excitement over having my cable box scan my retinal uh, patterns and let me know as it's watching me across multiple platforms and okay. No one seems to complain when it's your phone doing the same thing. Well, okay. I'm just thinking that uh, the eye's the next level yeah, here, and I understand that. I mean, I don't know if there's an equivalency. I'm just sort of curious what you guys think. I mean, uh, Shannon, do you guys have any uh, research on this over at HP as you evangelize this stuff? Uh, well, certainly retinal scanning is, is an option. Um, face scanning, the new Apple phone, it, it uses, you know, key points of your face to recognize that it's you. And I, I think uh, it's one of those things that before you know it, it'll just be happening and you won't even realize it. So well, I don't but think there's What's a interesting huge to me, though, it's one thing it. for Apple, which, which doesn't turn around and target so far, your ad, ads at you and all that, uh, and it's your phone that you carry around. I, I'm wondering if it's your cable company doing that, if you have the same equanimity toward the viewing process. But no offense to, to Comcast, it may not be the cable company. Okay. It's not you don't need the cable company yeah. in that scenario. It's, it's an authentication yeah, mechanism. It's going to be Google. It's authentication. <clears throat> okay, I've, I've, seen a, I've seen an interesting one, a use case that I keep pitching. It's a little startup I met uh, called Red Rock Biometrics. And uh, they have a mechanism that lets you authenticate using your palm print. You just hold it up to a camera and boom, that shows that it's me. I mean, that's less invasive because yeah. it's explicit. Yeah, it feels, you don't, well, you don't want it scanning your eye without it knowing it's scanning your eye. Well, it doesn't have to be an eye. Right. That was one example. But, yeah. I right. mean, the other but one it's, is... It's interesting, but I'm just saying that I, I'm, I'm wondering how far we've come as a society in terms of our comfort levels with uh, this higher level of authentication. Yes, it's all authentication, and when you're a technologist, it, it all kind of looks like it's on a spectrum, but when you're Joe Blow sitting uh, in his home or on the bus, maybe it it's feels It's a lot different. easier than remembering a password. Yeah, yeah, but I think your point is there, there, is a, there is a very significant difference between tracking me sort of externally as to where I am, and the new biometrics are going to be tracking me internally. So these are things that are going to know things about actually what I'm feeling. So if you look at sort of the last three major acquisitions on the biometric side, it was, it was all around eye tracking, right? So Apple quietly acquired SMI. Uh, iFluence was purchased by Google this time last year. I tried by Facebook. You know, Comcast isn't buying eye tracking companies. It's the platform that are buying these eye tracking companies. And once you have eye tracking and you have eye shape, then you have all the face biometrics that are going to be, going to be coming with galvanic skin response, ECG, um, once you can you know, track the diameter, the pupils will know what you're attracted to, they'll know your sexual orientation, they'll know you have glaucoma before you do. They're going to have and a diabetes. tremendous amount yeah. of information yeah. before yeah. you will even have it. They'll know a ton about you. They'll know what you're looking at and what you're feeling while you're looking at it. That's really, in my opinion, the ultimate business of VR, the VR, the immersive part of it, it's, it's a data vacuum. These things will be devices that you will wear that will tr give, deliver tremendous amounts of incredibly viable data to you to the platform. That's, that's the real business. And so your question about privacy, I do think it's actually much different than the one we've had before because it's now a question of privacy, not of like where I am or my phone is listening to me. I can turn off my phone. But my Alexa, which is a fairly 
dumb device right now is constantly listening to me will very soon be able to know my emotional state simply by the advances of NLP. And so that actually doesn't bother me because I wish she was a little bit smarter than she is now. Yeah, it's always a trade. But, but there are going to be a lot of things that, you know, platform companies that know, that can track pupil dilation and that can track skin flushing will know the 13-year-old boy is homosexual before he does. They'll, they'll know so much more information in the future. It's not two years, but it's coming. It's a different type of, of information. It's a type of privacy that the rest of us have lived with all our lives, our interior states being our interior states. That soon is going to be sort of mm -hmm. given away at the market of convenience. So your point is fair. We've all done it. We've all given away, given away convenience, or excuse me, privacy for convenience, and we, we're happy with the trade-offs. Uh, the trade-offs that these companies are going to be making the next two or three years is going to affect the a concept of privacy for our children and our younger children that they're not opting into that trade-off. So I think there's, there's a very real, very real privacy question that we're deciding for another group of people. So this is so interesting. What's panel. that yeah. famous but saying that says that if you're not paying for the product, you, you are, are the product. product? You are the product, yeah. Right. Yeah. I think that, so, yes. yeah. I think it was Machiavelli who said that, actually. But, <laughs> uh, but it's a good point. I mean, I think that, that one of the things that, that, that is worth talking about, one of the things that I harp about all the time is that traditional Hollywood, for instance, has no idea who their customers are. Or they have a very limited, shall we say, idea who their customers are. And they have to resell to them all the time. The advantage that Netflix and Amazon and Hulu have is they know very specific, deep stuff about their mm -hmm. folks. And that they can overlay it with other information that's out there. They can really generate some really interesting psychographic uh, detail that's fascinating and a little scary, and we talk about disclosures and, and all that. Um, but this does take it to that next level. And I guess one of the questions I have is, are the tech firms A or the traditional Hollywood firms B in any way able to do something with this in a useful way that's not destructive or potentially leads us open to the next level of the fake news, Russia stuff, et cetera, et cetera, that we've already gone through, particularly when you overlay artificial intelligence on top of that. Well, what's interesting is the creative community doesn't have access to this knowledge right. to make their creativity more accurate. If you have a... More likely to be compelling, basically. Yeah, my son has a series on Netflix. He doesn't know if it's a hit series or not a hit series. It gets renewed or it doesn't. That's a whole different way than Hollywood's... He has very binary information. He doesn't even get, like, here's your box office for the weekend. You did good or you did bad, right? right. He you doesn't have that. zero information. Um, but let me just give a use case where trading this privacy in this environment, we're working on a, uh, with a cosmetic company and uh, for a different part of the world where it has different Make things. Make something up. No, it's, it's facial recognition, and, and women have seen this. Many, many companies now have this where you can put on virtual lipstick either at home or in the store, and it's better than Snap. It really looks like it's on you. But it's memorizing. The biometrics is you can walk into any store and it knows your face quite accurately. And that mole that it knows on your face, when that perimeter changes, your cosmetic brand that you trust will suggest that you visit a dermatologist because it will identify melanomas before you know. Right. So there, there are new positives that come out of Absolutely. this. Absolutely. And there will always be new negatives that nobody thought of. So the question then becomes, does the makeup company not only suggest that you go to the dermatologist, but then also say, uh, hey, dermatologist in the area, you should reach out to her in marketing, and oh, by the way, we have a... Well, that gets back to brand and trust. So the yeah. biggest change that we're going to see is right now, we all take the, the flashlight app, and we just click through and don't realize who's getting all our, our data because it's a free flashlight app. In, as we start changing our view of the environment and the world around us, what brands we trust to give that to and what brands we don't becomes the biggest issue. So is part of what's going on with what's left of the, uh, the VR out-of-home experience is building the brands there that we may trust to see us shooting things and doing things? I mean, um, is there a race going on right now to actually get branded? I, we, I was at this, uh, when I was at the conference in Vegas last uh, month, uh, uh, they arranged for us all to go over to Zero Latency's uh, mm -hmm. free range, uh, free roam, I guess, arena and shoot some zombies and uh, killer robots, which is pretty damn fun and pretty compelling. Surprisingly so, you're in a black box with flat floor and you think at one point you're going up and down on an elevator, other times you think you're going on a quarter pipe, walking up a quarter pipe or across a very treacherous bridge while you're being shot by unfriendly drones. I mean, it's surprisingly engaging. Um, but. Zero latency doesn't have a brand at this point of any size. Is this a time for companies like them? And I mean, I guess IMAX starts with a big head start on everybody else, right? 
So who's who's going? What's going on here? Let me let me let me work for Nomadic for a minute. <laughs> so Nomadic's offering is really compelling in that it's it's kind of a think a, a box that arrives. It's like the back of a shipping container. A, you know, I don't know what the dimensions are, but 30 feet by 50 feet, something like sure. that. And inside, it's all white walls, and there's like a door here, and there's a table here, and there's a, there's a thing, a lift thing that kind of vibrates when you step on it. And so that's sort of like the platform itself is nomadic. And their idea, correct me if I'm wrong, is to enable developers other than nomadic, but also nomadic, to create content using these blank spaces. So this wall can now be the, the window looking out from the Death Star or something like that for one guy. And uh, the, for the next guy's content, this wall could be, I don't know, this, the New York Stock Exchange, all the monitors. Blah, blah, blah. So you can sort of lay virtual reality on actual reality. So I think, I think a nomadic experience makes sense uh, from a branding perspective. Yeah. I'm. Thank you, and you, we should cut you a check. Yeah, uh, yeah no, really, exactly. Really well He's done. totally buying you a drink here at the yeah. Skirball. Uh, no, it's uh, only going to be really cheap wine or old beer, but it's okay. So. <laughs> um, but I think to answer your question, I think any company would be foolish not to develop that relationship. And absolutely, really the race is for how can you insert yourself closest to the consumer. I think Google's in that race, Apple, Microsoft, everyone's sort of in that race to, uh, you know, where do you, where does the consumer meet the digital? And I think all the platforms are in the race. They want to be in the home. They want to be, you know, listening in your home all the time. They want to be the first thing in your pocket you reach for. And I think it would be unwise for a company like Nomadic to focus only on ticket-based and retail opportunities. Obviously, we want to sell tickets. We want to get people through the experience. But also, we have a chance to develop a relationship with consumers that companies like a Facebook, for example, you know, they have trouble you know, reaching out directly to people, getting certain types of people to interact with, uh, with their VR experience. VR right now is very young, very male, very affluent, but these location-based opportunities that are out in malls, this is a chance to engage with young mothers. This is a chance to engage with seniors, to get them to try these products that they, they otherwise would never even think to you know, consider. I cannot wait some. to see a grandmother shooting zombies. That's going to be so awesome. But Richard, you have some... So, so yeah, maybe to be, to, be <laughs> to be controversial or contradictory, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> uh, if we have those issues of, <clears throat> of privacy and, and all of a sudden users of the technology realize that they give a lot to the, to the system, uh, is it not another reason to make sure you have it at home and you don't open it up to, into public places? I mean, like last year, I'm shocked and I, I'd love someone from Sony to comment on that last year around that time of the year, it was, yeah. oh, VR is going to be big at home. This is when they had their role at almost exactly Sony the is day. finally yeah. going to get their VR uh, stuff out, and they have 40 million user base, and at Christmas it's going to sell like hotcake. Have anybody heard of how many they sold and how many I think it's about a million. million. They've, they've announced yeah. millions. They, they, they've, they've, yeah, I mean, it's, it, but it's, it's not the big thing. I mean, a lot of, um, I mean, and my included, some of the business plans that were out there were counting on millions of headsets in the home. Absolutely. Sony leading the charge, um, Samsung with the Gear VR following, even though it's a mobile piece of hardware, it was clearly described as a home thing just because you're not going to be in the bus or walking on the street with that thing in your head. Right. And, um, and what, what happened? What well, happened uh, to the business? What happened right. to the hardware? This you're, past you're totally year, right. nothing happened. You're right. So. Sorry, I'm refocusing on the hardware and VR. It, it's absolutely on point, and it's part of the reason why VR is where VR is right now. I will say that Sony did lead the charge. The charge wasn't as big as we thought it was. It was more the light brigade than the heavy brigade, yeah. and uh, you know how that worked out. Um, but they're still, they're still charging. I believe they've had over a million in sales, which leads everybody, which is a little surprising. But I thought all along, and I wrote about this in Tube Filter, uh, I thought all along that they would be the sort of the sweet spot in the... the, the the, the Goldilocks There's point. still a paucity of content. That's, so that's the other another side issue. So right. um, in thinking. our industry, we all look at, uh, at the Gartner hype cycle. And for those that don't know it, every technology goes up, gets super, super hyped. And then there's what's called the trough of disillusionment. And then you come out of that and you're real. So VR is now leaving the trough. It's AR the trough. has yeah. left the trough. Yeah. Uh, 3D printing is out of the trough. You know, AI, machine learning, you know, some of, some of the, uh, At the, peak the, of the, the next exponentials. Yeah, I, I, 
I IoT still hasn't, you know, peaked in its hype. Um, uh, so it's a normal, it, it, it happens with every, every new technology. We expect it to happen faster than it does, but it's happening regardless. Right. The, the other interesting trend that I think we've seen is that because the slow adoption of, of headsets has, has taken place, you're seeing a lot of content creators that were, you know, um, whose business models were predicated on in-home uh, consumer adoption, now retrofitting some of their content for location-based uh, implementation, which is actually pretty interesting because that is the near-term way that they can actually monetize that content aside from, you know, uh, a $2, you know, app in the app store for, for direct-to-consumer. Now, you, you mentioned before everybody came in, and good, good gracious, you all showed up. Thank goodness. But uh, before everybody showed up, you mentioned, uh, I believe, that today is uh, Oculus Rift uh, announcement day up, up north. Uh, so thank God you all missed that and came to the really interesting conversation. But they're possibly going to talk about this big thing that causes them not to be in the out-of-home market right now. I mean, uh, the, the panel I did last month, they were talking about you can't legally use an Oculus Rift headset in these big out-of-home experiences. You're, you're out of warranty if the thing breaks, which can happen when people are shooting stuff and running around into right. each other and all that. You're out of luck. So, Dylan, I think you were speculating they might announce, hey, we're uh, joining the real world here? Yeah, I think that, yeah, well, I, I don't know what they're going to announce and, and what they... Make stuff up. Come on. <laughs> This is a panel. I think it was, so I think to it was, my knowledge, was, they've they've changed that stance. Yeah. Um, they, you know, I think they've seen the success of Vive, Vive Port, and and you know, kind of location-based VR and, and the trend that's that's taking on there. And um, I don't think they want to miss out. So, to, yeah, I, I think they're they're actively. And I think that another thing they're going to is to the enterprise. I mean, so far, uh, Rift wasn't really available to enterprise customer, or at least not in a. Yeah, we announced in yeah. in May our partnership with 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 Facebook. Um, actually at con with a VR wine tasting uh, experience. Yeah. There's nothing that says wine to me like Deloitte Digital, Facebook <laughs> on the beach of France, France. <laughs> and VR. That's I, you know, it's a long, it's a long. Well, then I got to defend it because it was my stupid idea. Um, it was the Pepsi Challenge. If anybody remembers that, we we put you in VR and you were in this beautiful pastoral setting, the picnic, you know, the waving grass. And we gave you a wine to sip and describe this, this, this beautiful white wine in, in all your favorite words. And then you're now in a dank dungeon with flames and everything, and we give you a red wine, and you describe the tannins and everything. People go on and on. This is France. And then we take off the glasses, and you've been drinking the same wine twice. Right. And 90% of the people tasted different wine. Yep. So it was showing the power of, of VR marketing. of all of your senses. Yeah, yeah. VR and alcohol are never a good idea. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, there, there's some famous, I did some work in the wine business, and yes, there's a lot of, that's a very entertaining one. Uh, this does bring us to another hardware maker who is exiting. Yesterday, Nokia said, we give up. Uh, What's that about? Is that a good sign or a bad sign for VR? What does that all mean? Uh, you guys that are making stuff, let me know. What do you think? Who wants to chime in? I think the price point of the camera was untenable. I think forty-five thousand after yeah. they dropped it by fifty. Forty-five thousand and cut it in half price. You know, it's still too expensive. Yeah, a so, bargain at a third the price. Yeah. So, and these little little smaller Insta three hundred and sixty cameras coming out. You know. The Thetas, I mean, they're they're not great, but the you know, it's like, do I spend a thousand or thirty-five thousand? I mean, is all, it, is all it, the major studios. Is it thirty-five times better? Uh, I don't know. Are you talking about but, all the creator types, you know, the yeah, YouTube yeah. creators and stuff? I mean, I, I don't know. People that are in the studio business may talk more about that than me. But the, the one I interact with, the one I know, they've all used uh, the Ozo since day one. Yeah. So they're gonna feel let down big time. Um, I, I, don't know, I don't know what that means yet. I mean, uh, their announcement from yesterday, but uh, at first, b before knowing that announcement, you would say, oh, great, look, a company like Nokia with a lot of great minds, it's actually sure. Nokia technology, just, just to be fair. <laughs> it's their, their IP side. Of You're now on uh, 3D. Turn yeah. it sideways, too. And no, they, um, rotate they showed degrees. that there was an industry they were you. willing to make an investment, develop IP, <laughs> no. work with creators to develop oh, that idea and not 
I mean, willingly going with the creators and not the YouTubers and the UGC aspect of it. Uh, so that was very encouraging for the industry. So the fact that they're working out of that, I don't know if it's a good sign or a bad sign. I don't know what to make out of it. Right. That. Shannon, how much is that at $400, something crazy? $1,500? It's, it's real cheap. Oh, I think it's $200. Oh, that's $200. Yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. that's the Rico. I want to take a different. I mean, it's um, much lower quality, but it's pretty cool. I've worked but. with every, every camera um, to create 360 videos. And we had the jump, uh, the Google jump, the uh, mm -hmm. collaboration between GoPro and, and Google. Uh, we were working with the Ozo, uh, working with Insta360. Remember um, when we used to make grids of six GoPros in the yeah, rack? Yeah, the, the hero. Oh, oh my God. Of stuff. course, that was fun times. Yes. <laughs> but I think we were all technologists. And um, we, we love to, to, to work with technology, to, uh, to, to, to feel creative, to think what's possible and convince, try to convince the world that it's the, the, the next, you know, the best thing since sliced bread. I think we need to take the approach of, from the consumer's perspective, is this a product that I want to use? When do I choose this over something else? I think, personally, I've not seen, so I've, I've, I've created 360 videos, but when I wasn't creating them and watching it to be better at it, I wasn't consuming it because I thought it was good. I, I, there's obviously a hundred years of cinema, and we're just in early days of 360. But I'm, today, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the engagement numbers of some of the platforms. Good friends with many people that had, uh, whether it was uh, user-generated content in 360, if it's YouTube uh, videos, if it's Facebook. It's. I don't think it's a very right now a very compelling product. I don't know that there's a lot of business specifically in 360. Um, for people, I think the way that people use technology today is very different than we that we've known before. It's very short bursts of usage. I'm in line. Mm -hmm. I'm in the bathroom. I'm on the couch. A good example is I, I'm a huge fan of Next VR, huge fan, and I'm a huge sports fan. But I, I don't watch it on my Samsung Gear that that is gathering dust on my shelf. Because today I'm watching kids while I, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm watching sports while I'm playing with my kids. And I can't do that in VR. I wish I could do that, but that's when sports, live sports is, is aired. So I think from my customer's perspective, that's the dynamic. And now I'm looking for the best solution. And, and, and TV is still that. I think we need to understand the way that people use technology, the, the, the way that people um, weave it into their day-to-day -to -day life. I think the setup of VR is still a big challenge. Well, um, that, that leads us to the thing we should have been talking about all along, and I yeah. apologize because I'm a dirty bastard, but uh, AR, we're going to talk about it now. So, I heard it's going to be big. What do you guys yeah. think? So let me hit on the tipping point because AR is okay. there. Um, last year in the U.S., 85 million pairs of glasses were sold at over $100 price point. Let that sink in for a second. That's a lot of glasses. And all that they do is focus. We don't think about it that way. Last week when the, when the Pixel earbuds came out and you said, here's $150 earbuds that translate in 40 languages, you suddenly look at earbuds a whole different thing. Well, now AR glasses, there's a range of killer apps that will be the one app that gets you to pay if the price point starts coming down that it's not that much more than glasses that just focus. And so yes. I, I see AR being 75% of the market and VR being, you know, the, the baby sister. Uh, Thank you. I've been preaching this for so long, and, and I, 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 I literally say AR is two orders of magnitude bigger than VR. And in industry, we're seeing... Magnitude bigger. Two orders two, of magnitude. Two orders, so 100 times. 100 times. Or 800 times or whatever. Yeah. Whatever, okay. yep. But, but Lots yeah, of zeros. We're, we're seeing massive demand uh, for, for AR and for consumer uses of AR by major, major brands major retailers, changing your in-store experience, changing how you book a hotel, changing how you enjoy your day at, at, at a theme park, changing travel. I mean, the idea that you can look at any sign and get it translated, the, the idea that you're having fun in Costa Rica and you get bit by a snake and your glasses can identify and tell you, no, it's not poisonous, or who would you like to call? You've got three minutes left. Um, 
just <laughs> endless use cases. <laughs> Thanks but for I, the pity. I would be remiss if I don't tag on to a point you made earlier today, and that is, and back to VR. So commercial VR is where it's at. You got to follow the money. Who has the money to pay for these experiences? And I think in, in this, for this particular audience, we should think hard about developing commercial VR applications because it does require the same skill sets, which was your point earlier, the same kind of focus on delivering the content. And from that, then we gain adoption. I mean, my vision is that we will ultimately, everyone will have a screen, a keyboard, a mouse, and a headset at their desk. Like, that's going to happen. That's at work. Now, probably after you see that, you'll have them at home, and then you'll be looking for entertainment content and whatnot. But those same skills developing these commercial-ish VR content can be applied to AR as well. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, so Dylan, give me a sense from, from Comcast's standpoint. You, know, you guys are a big cable provider. Traditional entertainment is a giant chunk of the company, and being the pipeline for that giant chunk of the company uh, is basically what you guys do. Comcast Ventures, as the investment arm, are you looking in AR as an opportunity in the home or where, and how does that fit in with everything that you guys do? And, and Richard, I'd like the same question to you for Verizon, where it's, I think, a more obvious connection. So, Dylan first. Sure. Yeah, so, I mean, as a venture fund, we are looking at companies that may or may not have anything to do with Comcast's core business units. Um, and so, we make investments purely for financial return, which, you know, is different than a lot of other corporate venture funds who, you know, may be investing for strategic value add back, back to their mothership, right? So. Uh, the lens that we've, so that is the lens by which we look at just investments gen generically. Um, within AR, you know, we're investors in Meta, which is one of the, the major uh, headset manufacturers, which is focused on kind of the use case that was just mentioned, where, you know, I'm a white collar worker and I'm, you know, no longer going to have a display in front of me. I'm going to be wearing a headset and I might still have a mouse and a keyboard, um, although they're developing technology that will be able to read uh, the, the motions of your hands. Um, but that's kind of the, the path that they're going down, which is really interesting. Um, the other things that we've been focused on within AR are more the um, enterprise applications kind of outside of the, the, the white collar market, more of the, the blue collar um, type stuff. And so, you know, most of the, uh, the use cases that, that are, are readily available and popular right now are kind of basic and rudimentary and it's really kind of telepresence is kind of the major uh, use case that a lot of people are, are developing for or at least there's demand from uh, in consumers for. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's still early. I mean, I, I, I literally, I view the AR market being, you know, two to three years behind VR and, and VR is, is very uh, nascent as it is. So, um, you know, it's, it's early days and I think uh, it's interesting, you know, to see what, what you know, some of these, these content developers are, are building, but um, I think it's gonna take more time until, you know, kind of the killer use case has, has been uh, solved for. This is interesting though what you're saying because uh, two to three years behind, but I feel, I personally feel like uh, with Apple's AR kit, with AR code, the announcement by uh, Google that that will rapidly make up that two to three year gap because so many developers can get in for so little. But that's you know, that's overhead. at the first stage. I mean, to, that's the, mobile AR from your yourself, right? right? Yeah, right. Which yeah. are kind of you know is a stepping stone to the eventual kind of headworn yeah. display. Definitely or, a gateway drug. I get yeah, it. Exactly. And and we're um, so at Verizon. You can imagine that. Uh, it's not a question of whether or not we're going to play in that space. We, we are in the middle of that space. We're the nuts and bolts of that space just with connectivity alone. <clears throat> and uh, we're looking at 5G next generation uh, wireless uh, technologies to enable some use cases that are just not possible today for um, AR in particular. The, the key important thing for AR, let's say you have now your Gucci glasses, right? Not your Meta headset, but your Gucci glasses two, three years, four years, four years out, and you're walking in a street in a city you don't know, and we have that concept of, oh yeah, you look at that sign, you can translate it. So all of that is great, but you have to imagine that those glasses cannot carry a 16 core computer in the branches with the battery to operate it and everything to do the compute and the visual, the visual compute of, oh, this is a sign, this is a car, this is another human I'm talking to. So all of a sudden, we're looking at 5G as a way to offload all that compute outside on the network um, 
5G technologies allows latency less than 10 millisecond round trip when you talk to the network. That enables crazy use cases where you don't need to have the database of all the imagery and all the power of visual computing on the device itself, but you can have it at the edge of the network. So we're looking at a lot of ways to distribute microservices of computer vision, 3D rendering, and all the other services you can imagine running on servers that are going to be sitting on the base station of those 5G networks. So, oh, sorry. I'm just going to ask a really quick question of the entire panel. Where do folks think the actual, is it four years from everyday ergonomics? Because in my opinion, we're a decade from the final promise of AR is the everyday ergonomics that you're referring to, Jay. It was, and you kind of mentioned four years. Dylan, I'd be interested, like, it, it actually think, does make a difference in development of VR if people now feel that, oh, like, yeah, AR's caught up. I'm like, I think AR's a decade away from the kind of installations so that we're talking about. So let me answer that and, and go off of your excellent point of what Verizon's doing. Three we're working on next-gen sports stadiums right now. So you talk about a form of entertainment where we this do makes too. sense. <laughs> and we're working together. Um, uh, for a number of stadiums where right now the in-stadium experience for most sports is less than the home experience. Yes. You don't get replay. When somebody gets injured, you don't get to see a stat instantly of how that does for your fantasy team. You don't know that there's specials on food or any of the other stuff. And the team doesn't have any data of who are the best customers that show up early, who buys nine beers, you know, who, who shouldn't be driving, whatever it might be. So by having not let's wire all of Europe or all of the LA to have a walk around experience to have, they work in a venue. Your yeah. glasses work in that venue. Mm. Is it worth it? And there was a thing, uh, Kangaroo TV a few years ago, I don't know if anybody remembers, before you had smart, smart phones, it was for NASCAR races, so you could get stuff and you could rent that when you're in the stadium, yeah. and they'd rent out like crazy. So to have glasses that you just bring to game day, okay. every, if you see how much merchandise UCLA sells that's branded, I mean, this is a given at a two, three hundred dollar price mm -hmm. point. That's why I make fun of the glasses that just focus. Glasses that you just wear to your, to your sporting outing is a huge market. Mm -hmm. And so... Or to your opera, you know, for that matter. I mean, just the translative of your opera with your opera glasses all of a right. sudden being well, able would be kind of cool. There's many niches. So, so the point is, this isn't four years out. I know because of who we're working with what. We're talking about that this is, you know... Parts of this. Parts, parts of this reality are coming in, in 2018. Um, and they're killer apps, because they have to be killer apps. In, Intel point. is big into that, too. And uh, they, um, they actually have a deal with the IOC for the Olympics for the next two or three Olympics, I think, where they're going to bring more and more AR and VR experiences. I'm not allowed to say things, but that's a very interesting thing. <laughs> it's a um, fascinating thing that I'm sure Deloitte Digital would be interested in talking about further with you. <laughs> I want to... Can I make a quick comment about quick. form factor? Um, this is one of the products that we do. Um, not, again, not the market, just to show how, how small the, the, the wave guy, which is the lens, and then the projection module. And when you think about putting all the system on your head, like a HoloLens, that's one approach. And that's, that's very kind of early um, stages of that project. I think another school of thought is what can we remove from the head-mounted Yep, glasses right and put it right here. Yep. Yep. Can it be connected directly to your phone? Can it replace it be a, a screenless phone, so to speak, with having the CPU and the GPU, the storage, the RAM, everything that doesn't have to go on your on your head? Maybe we can just leave the optical system, cameras, maybe 3D sensors, and IMU, the bare bare bones of all you need mm -hmm. to, to have on your head. Um, allegedly. Magically, that's what they do and have two different packs, one for the battery and one for, for the components that don't have to go on, on the head. So I think we're used to being tethered. Um, right now, it's, uh, it's earphones. We're used to having cables run around us. I don't think, I don't think that's going to be a big um, issue. I think, again, from the use case standpoint, from the customer standpoint, what will I do with it? I think there are so many good, good ideas there, and I think your ideas or, or those propositions to start with specific locations, uh, I, I think that, and, that, that's and phenomenal. edge computing and relying on the network, tons of activity taking place there right now. Yep. Some Not amazing. just getting 5G in place, but actually figuring out what are the applications that make sense using that extremely high speed. 5G, if you don't know, is the, the next generation beyond current uh, uh, wireless stuff. Right, and to bring it full circle, 
to figure out where to put, because you don't need towers with 5G, it's more like a mesh, to figure out where to put those in the city, you use VR and improbable, and that's how you're actually planning out the future of telco deployment in VR first. Yep. Which might be valuable to Verizon. You guys should talk to Deloitte. I bet they could help you on that. Uh, real quickly, we have time for a question or two. If somebody here is curious, uh, you were here very first, so I'm going to give you a chance. Stand up and say who you are. Hi. Talk loud. I'm Charlie Bain, I'm from Forbes magazine. Uh, the, um, while you guys were talking, um, I was monitoring uh, Mark Zuckerberg's keynote yep. at Oculus tonight. We just happened to get this very moment. As we speak, Mark Zuckerberg said, drum roll, please. So they're going to miss the Christmas season and have a $199 uh, Oculus headset that they're going to put out. That's, yeah, that's in it. So $200 glasses that do more than focus. Yeah, okay. And, and are non-tethered. All right, but any, not the, any it's thoughts not their, on that, guys? That's not their only play, right? So I think Oculus, their strategy seems to be similar to the strategy of everyone else in the market, which is we don't really know what's going to work, so we try a bunch of different things at a bunch of different price points. So Microsoft obviously has the HoloLens, but they're now announcing this whole, I guess on the October 17th update to Windows 10, there's a whole range of headsets that will be VR, right. some say MR. Uh, you know, Oculus I think is, and I'm under NDA, so I don't, I don't know if I can say too much, they will have other entries at different price points at a higher end to see what the market will bear. I think the Ozo camera is just another example of an industry trying things. An extraordinarily expensive camera tied to something that doesn't monetize clearly. And it didn't work, and, and now you know, it's one less thing we're going to try. And it just seems to be clear across the whole spectrum, nobody really sort of knows, and so everyone's trying things at different parts of the market. We, but we'll need another one, though. I mean, the, the, the Ozo is like uh, the red camera. Right, I guess except, fa except, Facebook is going to, I yeah, thought they were maybe announced one Except that today. the red camera came in after the market was established, yeah. and it was knitted, and no consumer will buy a red camera, and it's not right. a consumer product. They'll buy a pink camera, but not a red one, because it's more like... <laughs> 2.5K or something. Uh, one more question, I think, back here. Stand up. Tell us who you are. Speak loud. Louder. Louder, louder. Real quick. So basically, who's, who's doing the good stuff now? It sounds like we're going to have a whole bunch of new stuff between what Ozo's gone, but what, what we know is coming from Oculus, but we can't talk about. And so can I address Microsoft's the blue power use cases yeah, yeah, right now? Yeah. Um, AR is being used in, in, especially in Texas with clients, in energy and oh, yes. oil exploration, field service like crazy. Uh, I wrote a piece on this in, in Fortune. Over the next decade, half of all electrical line workers in the U.S. retire. They're aging out. So now we don't have enough people and enough time to train them. So AR will be used because you can't bring manuals when you're climbing up a pole. Uh, tremendous worker use cases. There is, I, I see the windup. Um, there's a, a shipyard in something news, Maryland or Delaware. Uh, where Virginia all, Beach where all of the um, guys that actually build ships are all wearing AR glasses as part of the construction process. So we're seeing massive deployment in, 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 in blue collar, right down to the people that will be assembling your burger at fast food restaurants. That's right. We'll get the orders and know. Or your tractor what engine. What so that's doing. going on right now. You've got people assembling. So anyway, I think we are being. The price point. It was a price point question. No, no, no. Ge Gear not. VR is as good as it gets. <laughs> yeah, Gear, Gear VR, VR is probably about as good as it gets, and that's 25 <laughs> or 50 bucks, and it's thrown in when you buy. So that's kind of where the market is right now. So we are being given the wrap it up signal by the very insistent uh, tech uh, uh, queen in the back, and we will do so. Give this panel a big hand, if you will. Thank you, guys.